Well, it looks like we're back to talking about Iron Man Armored Adventures again. I'm really happy to see that a lot of you really enjoyed the last video I made about it, but I am sad that I talked about the MCU as much as I did, because I wasn't able to talk about other things that were really cool about the show. While my last video focused more on story and character, a couple people in the comments said they would like to see me cover the different armors of the show. Each and every armor has its own unique aesthetic, so I figured while I'm working on my Earth's Mightiest Heroes review, I can make a smaller, less complicated video in the meantime. We'll be covering the armors in chronological order, and if you really enjoy this video, let me know if you'd like to see me cover the villains' armors and tech someday as well. But without further ado, I give you every single Iron Man suit in Armored Adventures Explained. The first armor on our list is, of course, the Mark I. The Mark I was created by Tony as just another and one of his many inventions intended for Stark Industries. This one sets the precedent for all other suits on the list. The mask plate in particular is noticeably different from previous and present designs in other media, sporting a more round mask that retracts into pieces inside the helmet. The suit is extremely sleek and doesn't have a whole lot of bells and whistles, functioning more so as an all-around suit, adaptable to most scenarios. Its capabilities include repulsor beams and jet boots, allowing the pilot to reach supersonic speeds along with a repulsor shield capable of protecting the wearer from something as drastic as a plane crash with only one gauntlet generating it. Additionally, the armor is durable enough to protect the wearer from a relatively controlled re-entry from space. If the pilot is ever knocked out and in danger of having their identity revealed, the suit can be remotely locked up with minimal power. This can be terrifying to the wearer, however, as the armor essentially becomes a tomb preventing them from moving. And, uh... Yeah, that's a pretty bad way to go, if the comics are to be believed. In its normal mode, however, the suit is extremely flexible, able to fit most common body types and heights for different pilots. Tony also installed a computer AI in the armory systems that runs most digital functions. However, this AI was initially susceptible to corruption, as shown in the terrifying episode Man and Iron Man. This led to Tony almost being trapped in his suit forever by his AI, just to, as the computer puts it, The first protocol of this unit is protection of the wear. The greatest threat to Anthony Stark is Anthony Stark. What? You seek out danger. This cannot be allowed. Inside this unit, you are safe. So you will be contained within this unit indefinitely. So, uh, remember to get your AI tested, kids. Safety first. Also, in regards to its magnetic arc energy, the suit was capable of changing the frequencies of its repulsor blasts in order to combat things using the same frequency, like the living laser. The Mark I was also capable of absorbing repulsor energy, but was only able to do so from an exposed generator. So it's unlikely he could just simply do this to another Iron Man armor. It may not be the strongest suit in the show, but it is still more than capable of lifting things as large as train cars. Eventually, Tony even converted it into a backpack that could transform around the wearer with the push of a button. And as a huge fan of the suitcase suit, this made me pretty happy to see more than just once. And uh, oh yeah, it also has roller skates, because according to Tony, it uh, seemed like it could be useful at the time. And to an extent, he was kind of right. After all, if an EMP goes off and shuts down the digital systems that allow flight, you still need a way to get around fast. This silly gadget was only ever used once, but oddly enough, it it fit the plot that it was in. It was also fun to hear Tony try to justify them with a techno babble name because he was trying to make it seem cooler than just roller skates. Even though this aspect is silly, Tony's creativity allows him to be prepared for almost any scenario. Which brings us to... Originally starting out as gauntlet accessories for the Mark I, the Arctic armor was designed for below zero temperatures, as well as combating opponents with the ability to generate ice like Blizzard. While not the fastest armor on the list due to bulk, the Arctic armor more than makes up for it with its specialties. Heat is one of the primary weapons of the armor, able to heat its exterior to melt off the quickly generating ice of Blizzard, as well as repulsors and shielding that could easily take the villain out. The suit also had sonic disruptors to incapacitate unarmored opponents, 
sounds relatively painlessly. This also helps in an arctic environment, as the sound waves are easily able to shatter ice. It should also be noted that S.H.I.E.L.D. employed the arctic armor design for their mandroid robots. While not traditional armors, the mandroids were created by Hammer Multinational after Tony's armor specs were stolen and sold to the highest bidder. These robots may not be as durable as the standard armors, as shown when they were taken down by the extremist enhanced Malin, but they are still incredibly strong and possess an extremely powerful tractor beam that could render almost any foe immobile. This worked especially well when a mandroid unit worked together, making the beam strong enough to incapacitate something as powerful as the Hulk. But if it's a full-on upgrade to the basic suit you're looking for, we need only look at the Silver Centurion. While never officially named in the show, this armor's design is heavily inspired by the Silver Centurion armor from the comics. The comic version of the armor was designed to take down Obadiah Stane in his Ironmonger armor, and in Armored Adventures, the Silver Centurion suit was created for a somewhat similar purpose. After encountering villains with tech able to contend with the Mark I, Tony built the Silver Centurion, a slightly more upgraded version of the Mark I. It's mostly identical, except for its bulkier gauntlets and the slightly different color scheme. This suit doesn't exactly have many unique capabilities, but the episode he was introduced in, Whiplash, saw Tony go up against, well, Whiplash. And despite the episode coming out exactly a year prior to the movie, I'm pretty positive they were trying to hype up both the suitcase armor as well as Whiplash for Iron Man 2. The suit's most notable capability is that it was very resistant to electricity in particular, being completely wrapped up in Whiplash's electrical chains and still functioning perfectly, whereas the Mark 1 was dispatched quite handily by only a couple attacks from Whiplash. As mentioned, it also had large gauntlets, but the purpose of these, if there is one, is unknown. It's possible these are meant to keep the pilot its hands more fortified when battling enemies with cutting weapons like Killer Shrike. And of course, since this is my favorite armor in the series, that means it only shows up for about half an episode at most. Coincidentally, the red and silver suit happens to be my favorite suit in the movies as well. I just, uh, wish we got to see it more than two minutes. But seriously, God bless the modelers and animators that created that thing, oh my god. But next on the list, we have a suit that shows up much more often, or rather, rarely shows up at all. I'm of course referring to... Much like the Arctic armor, the stealth armor started out as a mere alteration to the Mark I, but eventually got its own color scheme and designation. Alongside the Mark I and II, this is probably the most prevalent armor in the series. Tony created the armor for, you guessed it, stealth operations, specifically sneaking into Stark Tower as Tony himself was banned from entering it by the CEO at the time, Obadiah Stane. While physically weaker, the stealth suit is still incredibly fast and has the basic capabilities of a standard armor, but most of the suit's power goes into its ability to warp light around itself to appear invisible, even masking heat signatures. Additionally, the sensors allow thermal scans, able to see through walls and locate enemies using similar stealth tech. Unfortunately, this tech is so good that it can allow other armors using it to see Iron Man even when fully cloaked. One aspect that isn't exactly unique to this suit, but is extremely effective for stealth operations, are the extendable cords located in the hand. These allow the suit to directly hack and download external material. Eventually, like most of the armors, it could be piloted remotely from the armory by Rhodey and eventually Pepper after he became War Machine. This became a necessity for all the armors, as in its first episode, Tony had to ditch the stealth suit in Star Tower because its cloaking field initially drained too much power and shut down. As a result, Tony, Rhodey, and Pepper had to concoct an elaborate and convoluted plan in order to sneak the stealth armor out of the building. This armor is easily one of the fastest, but objectively also the weakest. This is most likely because the cloaking field drains most of the armor's power, and Tony stripped it of heavier weapons to dedicate its energy consumption to its main specialty. When confronted by Titania Man, who was already a massive physical threat, the armor was practically torn apart before Rhodey came to Tony's rescue. After this fight, however, Tony realized the suit should probably be a little bit more prepared, and employed sonic disruptors into the suit. But when Tony needs pure muscle for a job, he calls in the Hulkbuster.
The Hulkbuster mech suit was created utilizing technology Tony took from defeated supervillains. While it's not entirely clear how the villain's gimmicks were implemented in the suit, the armor is easily the most physically powerful in Tony's arsenal. When Tony first fought the Crimson Dynamo with the Mark I, the best he could do was hope to slow the giant spacesuit down. However, when Tony faced an upgraded version of the Dynamo armor, his Hulkbuster was able to overpower it with sheer force. The suit is equipped with extremely powerful hand repulsors, as powerful as a standard Unibeam. The Unibeam essentially being a massive output of repulsor energy that would practically drain the Mark I. It also had a payload of rockets under the chest and twin miniguns located in the shoulders. Unfortunately, the armor is somewhat of a glass cannon. It was initially susceptible to pure electrical attacks and is much less flexible and mobile than the other armors. Although it is still able to fly at the very least, it's also susceptible to mental attacks from MODOK and the controller's discs. Not to mention, when facing opponents with near insurmountable strength like the Hulk or the walking fortress that was the Ironmonger, the armor is way out of its weight class. So as much as I like its more robotic design, I gotta say I do like the MCU versions of the suit much better, as they're much more versatile and effective. Not to mention, just straight up cooler looking. So it's a good thing Tony has created other much faster suits to maneuver these types of situations, such as... Iron Man armor was created to survive almost any conditions, but after having been hit by a gravity gun that sent Tony hurtling into space against his will, it's most likely this was the point Tony decided he might need a suit specifically for survival in space. The most notable aspect of the space armor, outside of its color scheme and missing mouthpiece, are its extra booster repulsors located on the back for escaping the atmosphere. This easily makes it the fastest flyer of Tony's armors. Naturally, as an armor made for space travel, it has an ample oxygen supply as well as communication line capable of communicating from an orbiting space station to a fortified bunker in New York City. The armor's connection to the armory most likely became a high priority after the aforementioned unintentional trip into space, which shut down most of the armor's functions. One of its most powerful and unique capabilities is being able to generate a selective magnetic field, giving the wearer limited magnokinesis. Despite its speed, the space armor was easily outclassed by the living laser, a being comprised of living light. Sometimes there are some dangers Tony has to overcome with his intelligence as opposed to pure strength and speed. Sometimes he's forced to fight the very armors he's designed. Which brings us to... This entry is a little different, as I'll be covering three armors instead of one. Now I know we're going a little bit out of order for this one, but that's because the Guardsmen are knockoff versions of former armors on the list. After Tony's armor specs are stolen by Ghost and sold to Obadiah Stane, Stark Industries produces Force, Shockwave, and Firepower. Not exactly the most creative names I know. Each are based on the Space, Stealth, and Hulkbuster suits respectively. They do have their own unique attributes though, the most notable of these being Force's capability to generate a hard light construct hand from his suit, somewhat similar to that of a Green Lantern. Not exactly sure when Tony added that to his armor specs, but then again he made laser gauntlets and roller skates that he only ever used once, so who am I to say what gadgets he hasn't created in his free time? The Shockwave suit also has the sonic disruptors of the Arctic suit, and Firepower has a giant missile attached to the back that can level an entire city block. Despite being based on actual Iron Man specs, the suits are made of cheaper materials as they are meant to be mass produced for the military. Even though the suits are technically knockoffs, I still love their designs and unique color schemes. Like many villains in the show, these armors are based on lesser known characters from the comics. Force originated as a Namor villain before going on to have a more prominent role in the Armor Wars alongside Firepower, a prototype battle armor created by the government to contain rogue metahumans. Interestingly, Shockwave is the only one of the group that is not an Iron Man villain, instead primarily having a history with the hero Shang-Chi. Armored Adventures, the trio are former gangsters hired by Obadiah Stane to promote the Guardsmen armors for military use. Granted, they ended up setting up scenarios to look more heroic than they first appeared. It's most likely Stane hired criminals to pilot the experimental armors, as they were probably cheaper labor and much more expendable than normal volunteers. But we've been talking about the normal Iron Man suits for a while. It's about time we gave my personal favorite character and his suit their due.
the War Machine armor is an absolute tank. Where the Hulkbuster armor was designed for close quarters combat, the War Machine armor is covered from head to toe in weapons for long range assault. These armaments range from tracking rockets, mini guns in the wrists, to even a missile launcher and a laser cannon located on each shoulder. This is all on top of the standard repulsors and unibeam. But being the most heavily fortified armor, it is inevitably one of the slowest next to the Hulkbuster. In fact, it has extra propulsion jets in the back and calves just to get in the air. But make no mistake, it can reach high speeds. In fact, it can even exit Earth's atmosphere. However, it was designed specifically for combat and does not have the connection capabilities of the space armor or the upgraded Mark I. The suit was first discovered by Rhodey when all the other armors were out of commission and Rhodey himself needed to save the rest of the team in the field. From then on, he became Iron Man's field partner with a much more stable armor as when Rhodey first tried on the Mark I, it was too fast for him to handle. It may not be my favorite suit or even my favorite version of the War Machine armor. That, yet again, has to go to one of the MCU versions. It's still extremely unique and well-designed as the proper tank that it is. So it's sad that despite its extreme power, Rhodey gets heavily warped in Season 2. Like, hard. <laughs> It is strange, considering Rhodey is the more level-headed member of the team, but giving him a suit that is more about long-range combat and strategy does at least fit with his personality, so treating him as a run-and-gun character didn't exactly fit. I think it was at the very least a missed opportunity. But it is still physically as strong, if not more so, than the Mark I and even Mark II. And speaking of which... Introduced in Season 2, the Mark II is the peak of Tony's present armors in the show. When Tony's Mark I is destroyed in a battle with Whiplash, Tony breaks out the new and improved Mark II. The suit isn't simply a replacement though. It includes a life support system that helps heal the body quicker than normal. And in terms of offensive capability, the suit includes a flamethrower, 3-pack mini missile launcher, sonic disruptors, and it's even able to generate energy fields around opponents to prevent escape. When Tony's armor specs were stolen and sold to Obadiah Stane, Tony he also added restraining bolt gadgets that were able to shut down the copies of his suits, but only temporarily, as they soon found a way to counteract this. But the most impressive part of the Mark II is less the upgraded nature of the armor and more the fact that Tony upgraded his own physiology. After nearly being killed by a shield agent with the extremist super soldier formula, Tony realized he needed faster reaction time to beat his opponent. Injecting himself with a modified version of Extremis, this allowed Tony to have a mental connection with his armor, able to summon the armor around himself at any time. Additionally, the formula made Tony a technopath, giving him the ability to hack into computer systems with only a thought. Surprisingly, despite this show and its circumstances being extremely different, this episode of the show was pretty on point with the main aspects of the Extremist comic it was based on. On top of this, Tony even implemented a force field into the suit that could shift to negative or positive magnetic charge to counteract the master of magnetism himself, Magneto, who was only able to use one type of magnetic charge at a time. Personally, I would have gone with the much more effective wooden gun method, but that may have been too powerful and I think the writers at least wanted Magneto to have a fighting chance. I must be f***ing dreaming this. But if you want to talk about ridiculously overpowered, <laughs> the next armor on our list is completely off the charts. After all, how do you fight technology so advanced that it's straight up from the future? Quite a few of you were pretty disappointed that I didn't cover this character in the main video. And in retrospect, I'm sad I didn't talk about him as well. Because Iron Man 2099 is easily one of the coolest characters in the show. Andro Stark is the grandson of Tony, hailing from a dark future where Tony creates a virus that wipes out humanity. Which, as people who are familiar with Tony Stark, at this point we ask the legitimate question, which one? But seriously, he's basically sacrificing his very existence and family to save the future. And he's more than equipped to do just that. He wears the most advanced armor seen in the show, almost appearing as a second skin with an energy field capable of disintegrating any physical attacks upon contact, even weapons made of vibranium. It's so futuristic that Andros states, Your antique Mark II armor against my Hyperpulse Mark IX armor is like a 
calculator competing against a supercomputer. He's not bluffing either. The armor is capable of time travel, teleporting multiple people, and even having an upgraded extremist that is 16.5 versions ahead of Tony's. Offensively, the suit is godlike, able to tank repulsors and even unibeams without even a scratch, and then subsequently return in kind, and then some. The armor has repulsors and an ultra beam capable of downing a helicarrier, and can generate energy shots capable of mass destruction, disabling technology, or even acting as homing shots that merely disarm and knock out opponents. Andros also has an AI, Jarvis, installed in the suit that can predict an opponent's moves even before they make them. It's even capable of creating hard light constructs, but how complicated they can be is unknown. Iron Man 2099 may seem invincible, but it is still susceptible to vibranium attacks that can get past weaker portions of the energy shield. It's just a shame that this was the last time Andro Stark appeared as a character, in any Marvel product by the way. Which you might be asking the question, but wait a minute, isn't there 2099 Iron Man in the comics as well? After all, the concept of Iron Man would fit right at home in the futuristic world of 2099. And yeah, yeah you'd be correct, this is the Iron Man they gave us. Thanks, Marvel! Ugh. Y you know, now that I look at it, I'm starting to realize why the 2099 brand was never all that successful outside of Punisher and Spider-Man. But at long last, this brings us to our final armor on the list, which really did please fans. Everybody give it up for... The Stealth Armor Mark II is easily one of my favorite armors in any Marvel Universe. It was created specifically for use by Pepper Potts. After practicing with the remote-controlled Stealth Armor a lot, Tony finally made Pepper her own armor. She also really, really, really wanted her own suit, so Tony also probably wanted to make her stop asking. While this may not be the first appearance of the Rescue Armor in media, it easily is the best designed version. The Rescue Armor is one of the more unique ones made, having a very different color palette and faceplate, not to mention being one of the leanest and fastest models, which very much does fall in line with Pepper's personality. It has the standard loadout of the other armors, but per Pepper's own request, the suit also is equipped with energy bombs, or laser grenades, as she puts it. And naturally, her armor also has the capabilities of the original stealth armor. I do also appreciate that they gave her unique shapes for her unibeam and hand repulsors. So seeing a variation on this design for the endgame version of the suit made me very, very happy. Granted, they didn't exactly get the color scheme exactly right, but you know what? I waited a long time for that. I'll take what I can get. Sadly, this armor was introduced in the last three episodes, which of course means it didn't get as much time to shine as the others. But for what little time it has on screen, it really made a big impression. I mean, it wouldn't be an endgame if it didn't. And at that, we have every single Iron Man armor from Armored Adventures. I hope you all enjoyed this list. It was a fun side project for me, and like I said at the beginning, if you'd like me to cover the villains' armors in tech, if this video gets popular enough, I might do just that. But in the meantime, I've got to get back to work on the EMH review, so I'll see you guys next time for more comic book talk, animations, and reviews. Y'all have a good one.